For our penultimate annotated reading, we're going to take a tour back in time in order to look at a short selection from the political treatise Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. Our reading will focus on just one of the many chapters of that book, chapter 13, which defines what Hobbes called the state of nature. Hobbes wrote Leviathan in the late 17th century, but don't worry about having to read through particularly archaic language. Writing and publishing the book in 1651, Hobbes was not bound by the normalization of the English language, which means the original text can be difficult to work through simply because of strange spellings and punctuation usages. The selection we will be reading has been modernized to make it more accessible, although I should note that the people who adapted it did not correct the highly gendered language. That's not to say this won't challenge you, though. Hobbes is working through some complex philosophical ideas in order to come to his conclusion, so you'll still need to give yourself the time to work through the reading. As always, be sure to help yourself and your classmates by annotating the reading through thoroughly. Remember, this is a collaborative reading. The more you each contribute, the greater the class-wide understanding of the text will be. Born in 1588, Thomas Hobbes was a philosopher and scholar. During the English Civil War, he served as a tutor to Charles, the Prince of Wales, who would soon become King Charles II. What we now call the English Civil War was really a series of battles between royalists who believed that the king of the country was a, quote, little god on earth, and thus had absolute power over every aspect of the country, and the parliamentarians who believed that the king should just be a figurehead, with the country being run by the legislature. Although, again, we should note that this early form of parliament was made up entirely of wealthy white men, not democratically elected representatives. Hobbes was a royalist and was greatly troubled by the violence he saw going on throughout the 1640s. Hobbes wrote Leviathan as a justification for the royalist beliefs. In it, he argues that humanity can only function ethically and morally if ruled by the absolute power of a strong monarch. Hobbes called his book Leviathan after a number of references to a gigantic sea creature in the Hebrew Bible. In the book of Job, the book of Isaiah, and the book of Amos, we can read about a monstrous sea creature who is essentially the embodiment of chaos. So it's interesting to me that Hobbes chose such a title for his book about granting power to a single individual in order to ensure order within society. Hobbes argues for this singularly powerful ruler by explaining that humanity, without society, lives in chaos. Hobbes called this the state of nature. And it's this concept that we'll read about in our selection from Leviathan. As you read, you may see some interesting intersections with Freud's theory about civilization. But consider also how the ideas of Umberto Eco and Iris Young intersect as well. Consider what Hobbes says we must do to keep ourselves out of the chaos of nature, what some have since come to call the Hobbesian jungle. The jungle in this formulation is not so much a specific place, but an archetypal symbol of fear. It's the forest in Little Red Riding Hood, the wilderness that surrounds the village in the Scarlet Letter. It's nature at its most lethal. But notice also that Hobbes doesn't judge us for our selfish behaviors, when we're in that state of nature. We are what we are, he says, which can also give us a lot to think about. The Hobbesian jungle, or whatever else you want to call it, is a common trope in science fiction films and books. It's particularly popular with post-apocalyptic stories. Think about The Road, the novel by Cormac McCarthy and the film based on it. In that story, a father and son struggle to make their way to the Gulf Coast after an unidentified environmental disaster wipes out most of humanity and consequently resets the world to a place of greed and violence. The question with many such stories, though, is whether to call them dystopian. Is any imaginary setting that lacks all form of order a dystopia? It really depends on how we define dystopia. If our definition includes some idea of oppression, then I would suggest not, since there can be no system of oppression if there is no system. Finally, consider this reading as I asked you to consider the reading of Freud. We may not agree with their final conclusions. We may not agree with many of their opinions, but we can consider the logic they use to arrive at those conclusions and use them to make our own analyses about humanity and our need for order 
and what we're willing and not willing to surrender in exchange for that order.